Susie Menkes is the fashion world's most respected long-standing critic. For more than 25 years, she reported on the global fashion industry for the International Herald Tribune. But during the last Paris Fashion Week in March, Susie took the fashion world by surprise when it was announced that she was moving to Condé Nast to become the International Vogue editor, a new role where she is to pen a global column and write reviews that will appear on 19 different Vogue websites around the world. In her first major interview since taking on this new role, the business of fashion goes inside the new digital first world of Susie Menkes. Thank you, Susie, for sitting down with me today uh, in your very first week here at Condé Nast as International Vogue editor. How does it feel to be here? Is it, is it very different from being at a newspaper? I feel fantastic, not just being at Vogue, which is exciting in itself, but it's Vogue's. My words go around the world to all these different Vogue's. We're talking about online, of course, but we're talking about Brazil, we're talking about Moscow, we're talking about China, we're talking about India. And that idea that you can really reach across the world is very exciting. Before we get into more detail on your new role, I wanted to go a little bit into the past, not to focus on the past, but I think you've had such an interesting journey that brought you here. And I wondered if you could tell us how you ended up in, the, in this industry in the first place as a fashion editor and as a fashion critic. And you know, when did you first realize that this was your calling? I think I should pass this question over to my mother because she would show you the little newspaper I made at the age of five and what do you know, there is a little picture that could be taken as a fashion picture on the front of it. Right from the start I was always fascinated by newsprint and when I went to Cambridge University the first thing I did, my very first day, was to sign up to work for Varsity, the university newspaper. If anyone was a directed and focused person, it was me. And what, what attracted you to, to kind of writing or journalism in the first place? So, you know, writing for Varsity, um, the Cambridge newspaper, is, you know, it's a worlds apart from, say, becoming a fashion editor. I mean, how did that journey happen between Cambridge and, and now here at the Vogue offices? You know, I think that in the 1970s, which is what we're talking about, there wasn't such a division between the idea of being a serious journalist and being a light-hearted journalist, if that's what it is. I suppose you could say that what I looked at was the idea of taking what other people, not myself, consider a light-hearted subject and looking at it seriously not solemnly, but seriously, looking at the industry, looking at what it takes to make a great designer, and just bringing journalistic skills that would be used in so many other ways to the world of fashion. You very recently, during Paris Fashion Week, took all of us by surprise. I won't forget the moment that um, I received the press release from Condé Nast, thinking, wow, that was a real surprise. And I think one of the questions I wanted to ask was, just put us into your head for a moment. You know, I think you know, you've had this illustrious career, and I say that with the greatest respect because so many people in the industry, we all look up to you. And I just, I, want, I wanted to understand for me, but also for all of us you know, that look up to you, you know, what was it that motivated you at this point in your career to make such a big change? You know the word that is absolutely of the moment now in the whole fashion world, which is relevant. You have to be relevant, and you have to be relevant too in the world of what is going on in the media. And I felt frustrated because I felt that I was linked, I felt proud to be linked to a newspaper, both the International Herald Tribune and the New York Times, that is renowned around the world. But at the same time, so much else was going on. Of course, I had stuff put up online, but I never got sense um, that that was the first approach, that the first thing somebody thought when they saw my copy was, let's get that up. But I want to be part of that. You know, I've never been afraid of technology right from the start. I, you can find a picture of me if you look on Ab Fab, which I think is, um, must have been back in the early 90s or late 80s, and you'll see a picture of me sitting there with a computer on my lap. I've never been put off by that idea, and I want to be part of what's going on now. I, of course, have been on Facebook and have my stuff there, 
And there is a limited amount of time, I think, that any journalist should spend in glorifying themselves online. But you know, Instagram is fun. I think it's fun to do it, and I want to share things with people. But most of all, I am so proud at sharing what I write with people. Look, I've been writing for years about uh, designers from, let's say, Tokyo. You know, I was one of the first people to talk about the influx of Japanese designers and what it meant. I've written countless articles. And yet those people in Tokyo, you know, I, maybe some of them have had it sort of faxed over and had it translated. But this is immediate. This is people who can see me and read me and feel me. And I'm thrilled about that. So is this a digital first global Susie Menkes that's emerged? I would say this is a digital first, that I really can be read everywhere. But I've always been part of this in my head. And of course, all the time doing conferences, I've done videos, so I haven't ever thought of myself as apart from what was going on in the mainstream. But at the same time, you know, I didn't want to have just a blog and retire effectively, because I don't feel like retiring. I've got lots of energy left. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this move from what people might see as an independent newspaper to a consumer magazine. Because of course, the conventional wisdom is that many of the magazines in the fashion industry have much tighter relationships with advertisers and therefore aren't necessarily able to say what they might really think. You know, we all come to Susie Menkes because you always say what you really think, always in a very respectful way, mind you. So I guess in, the, in, in one respect, you're freed of the constraints of print in terms of time and space, but there might be new constraints in your new role. I do not believe that Vogue is going to rein me in, in terms of what I do. Jonathan Newhouse said to me right from the get-go that this was not his the idea, because obviously, what is the point of hiring Susie Menkes and getting some dumbed-down version? Right. I also can't change myself, you know, I'm always going to be that hopeless fashion editor who'd rather have a bag big enough to shove my laptop in it and a few other things as well, rather than to be sitting there in the front row with the latest handbag, whether or not it has been bought or given. I do have strong views about not accepting gifts. I mean, I won't say I don't mind a bottle of champagne and I've received some gorgeous flowers. But I don't think that you can be a serious journalist if you are accepting gifts. It's it is slightly different if you're on a magazine because then you are the sort of the persona of the magazine people really has to be in phase with what is fashionable at the moment and on the salaries that most people are paid you know it would not be possible to buy all these clothes so I can sort of see that I, I think it makes sense as a framework for the people but you know let's face it even if I put on the best of designer clothes I don't think I'm going to fool anybody really that I'm a voguette <laughs> so my plan is to be known here at Vogue as I was at the IHT for my writing. Well, one of the things you said in your first column for um, Vogue, which came out this week, was uh, with the headline, quite provocative, Fighting the Bitch Brigade. You wrote, if the bitches are winning, the true fashion lovers are losing. Susie Menkes in Vogue is going to be anti-bitch. Um, first of all, that's not typically the kind of headline that one would see in a newspaper. So it's, it's kind of opened things up. But I wonder, you know, what did you mean by that? And why, why is that the right approach for you? I don't think online commentary should be judge and jury and always looking at the nasty side. Mm -hmm. You know, I understand that people who want to draw attention to themselves have to do that kind of thing. But being bitchy about everything is just depressing. You know, why can't we celebrate? Okay, maybe a lot of people on the red carpet look a mess, and okay, maybe you want to take them apart or complain that they're too Botoxed, you can do all that. But what about the other side? What about, here is somebody who looks fantastic, you know, what a way she or he puts themselves together. There are all sorts of positive things you can say. And if I wished for anything, it would be that positivization it's a good word, isn't it, mm -hmm. of um, what is happening on the internet in general. I don't think you see entirely negative things, but you see an awful lot of them. And it's mostly what concerns me is the, it's the comments of ordinary people. You know, it's the TMZ people asked with what they think, and a lot of what they say is so cruel. Mm -hmm. And why do you have to pick people apart? We're not all so wonderful, are we? No. And, you know, it's nice that, you know, I was looking at some of the 
the comments that had popped up on your Facebook page when you posted the article and I think positivity breeds positivity. Someone wrote um, in a response to what you said that social media has given the mean girls of this world too much power to criticize others without repercussions and this particular commenter congratulated you on your positive stance. So I think that's a really meaningful and, pos and, 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 and beneficial approach for us as, as we think about you. Um, but, you know, the second column was very different from the first um, because it was about students and where things stand today. And that's really a very serious column. I mean, it deserved much more space and much more research. I think the uh, two things that I brought out that really haven't been discussed before are the terrible problems in England, not the death of Louise Wilson, although that's so very sad, but talking about the fact that now students have to have such enormous loans. You know, this is the first generation of students that I've been looking at this summer in England who is leaving the colleges with these extraordinary heavy loans. Of course, this is familiar in America, but not familiar at all to the British. And, you know, looking back, how would Lee McQueen ever have got where he was mm -hmm. if he had had to pay out these enormous sums? He'd never have got himself together. We know that. Nor John Galliano. This is 30 years since John Galliano graduated. And, you know, people ask why they don't see any more of these people. Well, this is one of the reasons. One other thing I wanted to touch upon was um, imagery and, and how, you know, you, you wrote something on your Facebook page recently, you said the digital camera rocking fashion across the world in nanoseconds changed everything. I mean, you've been around to watch this change in imagery and fashion, right? And I think, you know, I, I, ca I can't even imagine what it was like back in the early day, but maybe you can tell us how the image of fashion has changed because, you know, we, we've, we live in a world of instant imagery now. I mean, you, you know, you're okay. using Instagram too, but what was it like before? I want to give you a vision of Susie Menkes, 1988, just starting at the International Herald Tribune. So this is what you had to do. I had my wonderful, faithful photographer, Christopher Moore, who is a genius at doing show pictures at my side. And when the show finished, we ran, no looking in the camera to see what's going to be, we ran together to the place where this guy who was only actually good in the morning because he was dead drunk in the afternoon would develop the pictures and print them out. When we had the prints, somebody got on a bicycle or somebody got on in a taxi and took it to the office, which was in Neuilly, outside the centre of Paris. That is how we got pictures into the paper. And you know, it wasn't much slower than what we are doing now. Of course, it isn't, wasn't instant, but that's what you had to go through. And the whole thing of contact sheets, you know, I mean, contact sheets now have this rather beautiful, historic beauty. But contact sheets were the sort of bane of one's life because you went through it and the photographers naturally always saw differently from yourself. And these things, it's amazing how it changed. You know, 1985 changed everything. That was the invention of the digital camera for everybody to use. And you know, like everything else, like Google's new car that will drive without you, you don't believe it's happening mm -hmm. until it happens. You think it'll never catch on. You know, these photographers, they're trained to take their cameras and do these pictures so beautifully. And five minutes later, they were all on the digital and that's the way it was. What I think's changed with the instant images is the idea, which is good for journalists, that you can actually pick out the picture that you think is the one that really pulls the story of the show. Especially somebody like Prado, it's true, also Dior, all the major designers. You can catch that one thing. And what is so interesting to me is that all those years I always noticed when we were limited, you see, not online, lots of pictures, but when we were limited to a few, all I would say good fashion editors always chose the same picture. You've got a show of 57 outfits. Why do they all choose the same one? Because that's the relevant one. It's interesting that you talk about digital cameras. One question that might be slightly off topic, but I've always wanted to ask you is, you always have those disposable cameras with you and you're snapping photos. And you wouldn't believe how many fashion people wonder what Susie's going to do with those. What, you know, are you going to turn, some people say, oh, they're just fake cameras because, you know, Susie's just trying to, like, get you in a random moment. And, and other people say, oh, she's built up this massive archive and there's going to be a book. Can you kind of set the record straight? Do you have any plans for those photos? You know what I think is the sweetest word in the English language now? Private. 
I think the idea of privacy, which is gone, it's completely gone now. But it was something rather special. And I feel that my photos are private. This is not to say that one day they're not going to come out. I also kept, have kept diaries for 25 years. They're private too. And of course one day I hope that some of them will be published. But I'm not in a rush. In a way I think photographs become more precious with the passing of time. Of course, nobody who's putting something up on Instagram at this moment is ever going to believe me. But I think that. I think that, you know, a photograph can mature. It can become more painful to look at when you know that this person is no longer with us. It can be more exciting and amazing when you realize you caught a couple right at the beginning of a relationship. There's all sorts of things about looking back on photographs, which I'm quite happy to keep for a little while. Have you developed those photos at all, or are they sitting there to be ready to be developed one day? Yes, of course I had them all developed. That was the fun of it, going to the camera shop and having them done and looking at them. I still can think of getting the thrill of that. Um, a lot of them have been digitalized, and they're all ready to go. And one day you may share some of them with the rest of the world. I mean, I've learned so much in this conversation. We have the digital first Susie Menkes using Instagram and, 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 and embracing digital, but also the Susie Menkes who's maintaining her private stash of thoughts and comments and imagery. And one day, um, I, you know, I think the world would love to see them. I think it's a really super exciting moment for you, Susie, and I really want to wish you the best of luck in this new phase. We're all very eager um, to see how you transition your approach to digital. As you say, you've always been someone who, who moves fast and I think the digital world will have trouble keeping up with you. So best of luck to you. Thank you. It's been fun to talk to you. You too.